Pilot Wings, Nintendo's amateur flight simulator franchise, lay dormant for around 15 years after its 1996 installment on the Nintendo 64. It finally re-emerged at the launch of the Nintendo 3DS in 2011, breaking its extended hiatus with Pilot Wings Resort. However, throughout the 2000s, we almost saw the series return on multiple separate occasions across two generations of Nintendo hardware. The first of these came close to happening on the GameCube in around 2003. Nintendo had been in talks with Turrican and Star Wars Rogue Squadron developers Factor 5 to bring an alternative take on the series. It was intended to be done sometime after the development of Star Wars Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike and was even teased by then CEO of Nintendo Satoru Iwata at E3 2003. Julian Egbrecht, the president of Factor 5 Inc was directing the project, envisioning a pilot wing set in the real world during the height of the Cold War. It was supposed to have the player train as a pilot in its initial stages before being recruited to carry out top secret missions for the military using various aircraft. Vastly different in theme and tone from any previous entry in the series, Pilot Wings for GameCube was inspired by some of Egbrecht's favourite films, namely The Right Stuff from 1983, a movie which revolved around the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Despite both Factor 5 and Nintendo being enthusiastic about the game's potential, it was ultimately prevented from moving forward. Factor 5's main partner and benefactor was LucasArts, who had worked with them closely on the Star Wars Rogue Squadron games. With them they had produced both Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 and 3 as GameCube exclusives. While Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 was a huge success at the launch of the system, its follow-up didn't perform nearly as well, much to the dismay of LucasArts. Blaming the GameCube's lacklustre sales, they began putting pressure on Factor 5 to end their exclusive relationship with Nintendo and start porting the Star Wars titles to the Xbox, a console with a larger install base. Factor 5 eventually succumbed to their demand and starting development on a collection of the Rogue Squadron games for the Xbox and taking their ideas for the Pilot Wings project with them. In the end, the Cold War Flight project that was originally supposed to be a Pilot Wings reboot never came together, and neither did their Xbox port of the Rogue Squadron game for that matter, which was shut down at around 50% completion in 2004. Around three to four years after the GameCube Pilot Wings fizzled out, Factor 5 had since been through a succession of rocky partnerships with Microsoft and Sony. Julian Egbrecht and his associates had been wanting to try their hand at creating games for the Nintendo Wii. When their collaboration with Sony met a premature end, they immediately jumped into Wii development in August 2007. Nintendo, who had since remained friendly with them, was pleased to have them back on board. Factor 5 began putting together pitches to work on a couple of first-party Nintendo properties as potential Wii exclusives. One of these, being made by a team of developers under Eggbrecht's close supervision, was their revised spin on Pilot Wings. On the Wii, they adopted a very different approach to the series. As opposed to the dark, Cold War affair they had once suggested, they went for something lighter and more marketable to the Wii's audience. Its art style was particularly reminiscent of the Wii Sports airplane demo that was shown at E3 2006. In comparison with their previous attempt on the GameCube, it was much more oriented towards casual play players, but that's not to say the project was any smaller on ambition. On the contrary, had it been made, it would have been by far the largest Pilot Wings game to date, with a wealth of content laid out. The game would have operated as one massive open world based loosely around planet Earth. Players would have set off to explore it in various aircraft, flying over and completing missions around iconic real-life landmarks. The pitch's largest innovation, however, was its use of a brand new peripheral Factor 5 or design. They had entered talks with Nintendo for them to produce it as an officially licensed Nintendo Wii accessory. This was a pair of glasses to be worn by the user that were capable of tracking head movement. Former staff say it was inspired by an experiment devised by computer scientist Johnny Chung Lee. In 2007, he released a video showing a homemade setup of his involving a pair of glasses with infrared LEDs attached. Using the infrared camera in the Wii remote by placing it in front of a television, he used it to track the position and movement of the lights mounted on the glass. Glasses. Utilised in tandem with a computer program displayed on a TV, this produced a 3D effect for the wearer. It could also allow the user to explore more of the environment displayed on the TV by simply turning their head and adjusting their position. Factor 5 developed their own version of the head tracking technology to work directly with the Wii using essentially the same principles, headgear emitting two sources of infrared light that the Wii could track. I spoke with Julian Egbrecht who shed more light on this aspect of the project. According to Julian 
Julie and his developers created their own early prototypes for the glasses peripheral to sell the idea to Nintendo, which were made using parts from dismantled Wii sensor bars. They were able to implement their glasses prototype into two of the games they had in the works at the time, their demo for Pilot Wings and their revamped Wii collection of the Star Wars Rogue Squadron titles. In both games, they essentially serve the same purpose on a gameplay level. The player could tilt their head to control the in-game camera, creating a solution for the Wii Remote's lack of a C-stick, even when coupled with a nunchuck. Via head tracking, players could naturally manipulate their viewpoint by turning and looking inside the screen with a 3D effect of sorts. Julian told me that it worked like a charm and that the effect was especially impressive when switching to the first person cockpit view built into both games. To take advantage of this feature and encourage players to use it, the developers started to place easter eggs into the cockpits. For example, one artist added a picture of a cat to the interior of one of the vehicles. Former Factor 5 members are tight-lipped about why exactly this happened, but their pitch to do the Pilot Wings Wii game was eventually turned down by Nintendo in mid-2008. One ex-developer offered speculation that it might have been turned down due to Nintendo already working on the island flyover game in Wii Sports Resort, which was heavily inspired by Pilot Wings, and that they may have already had their own plans for the series at that point, since Pilot Wings Resort released just three years later. Regardless of this, Julian and his team remained determined to make the game happen, and reworked what they had already made into an original IP. Building upon their prototype and using the same ideas outlined in the pitch, it would be their proposed revival of Pilot Wings in all but name. The project from this stage onwards appears to have existed under a few different titles. At an early phase of development, it was referred to under the internal codename of Sky, before being called We Flight by some, and then We Fly. According to a former associate of the developer, it was apparently pitched to a small handful of well known publishers, including 2K Games and Namco. None of them wanted to fund a full game. Eventually, however, the project landed on its feet with a company named Green Screen Interactive Software. Green Screen was a new publisher founded in New York City in 2008. In April of that year, they acquired Zoo Digital Publishing and Destination Software to make a new casual video game label called Zoo Games. Zoo had lofty aspirations of funding and producing original high-quality casual games from companies around the world. World. We Fly by Factor 5 was chosen to be among the first in this new venture. At one point, the game briefly ran into legal issues surrounding its name. Factor 5 had decided that its codename, We Fly, would become its official title, and had their legal representatives try to secure it. However, Nintendo would not allow them to call it that, believing that it would have infringed upon their trademark for the Wii game series that encompasses games like Wii Sports, Wii Play, Wii Fit, etc. Since We Fly had no official association with that series, Series, they were told the name could not be used regardless of it being stylized as one word. In spite of this, Factor 5's management was still reluctant to change the title, having already grown fond of it. Instead of completely dropping the name, they chose to simply alter the spelling of Wii from W-I-I to W-E. That's not to suggest the game somehow lacked Nintendo's blessing in any way. Former Factor 5 members say Nintendo was still maintaining a keen interest in everything they were working on. They gave the developers the green light to implement playable Mii characters into the game, and according to Julian Egbrecht, were even still on board to produce their aforementioned head tracking glasses. Altogether, the project is said to have been in the works for around just over a year, and was able to make substantial progress during that time. The team had built a plethora of distinct environments set around its virtual globe, it was a huge, sprawling world that pushed the Wii to its limits with advanced water effects and a global illumination lighting system. It all ran on Factor 5's internally made Lair Wii engine. This was basically the technology used to power Lair, upgraded and adapted for Nintendo's hardware. Players could roam the entire planet without pausing for loading screens, as it streamed Grand Theft Auto style. Each time a new location was discovered, it would be added to the globe on the main menu, allowing players to take off from there at the start of the next play session. Each city was filled with unique features and objectives to complete. Some of the missions were traditional pilot wings fare, where you'd have to fly through hoops, carefully land on platforms, or collect stars. Although Factor 5 was bringing to the table plenty of new ideas of their own too. At night, players could shoot fireworks at targets in the sky to create a fireworks display for the people below. They were also taking advantage of its real-world setting by challenging players to fly by famous landmarks and snap photos next to them. The lineup of playable vehicles 
vehicles was diverse, featuring in addition to the more expected jets, biplanes, hand gliders and rocket belts, some more outlandish choices that showed the game's wackier side. Players could eventually unlock a hot air balloon and a magic flying carpet. Factor 5 even had a second open world stage set on the moon, where players could explore such sites as a human colony using ships like a lunar spacecraft and a flying saucer. In development assets show that you could fly all the way to the North Pole where you could find Santa's workshop too. A feature that illustrates how Factor 5's developers were trying to take advantage of everything that we had to offer was its interaction with the console's weather channel. The now defunct application allowed Wii owners to check the weather around the world by navigating a three-dimensional globe interface. Factor 5 had negotiated with Nintendo to let them use data from the weather channel, allowing them to replicate live, real-life weather conditions inside the game. It also followed a real-time 24-hour day-night cycle accurate to every time zone. If there was an evening of rain in London while New York City was simultaneously enjoying clear skies in the afternoon, the game could effortlessly reproduce that. Overall, a good amount of We Fly appears to have been completed with a myriad of different locales mapped out. Towards the end of 2008, its development was brought to an abrupt close, when the studio was torn apart. After the publisher supporting one of their other projects at the time, Superman, fell to bankruptcy, Factor 5 Inc. began hemorrhaging money. On top of that, Wii Fly's publisher, Green Screen Interactive, was struck by similar issues. Unable to bear the brunt of the global financial crisis, they too went bankrupt. Without publisher backing, Factor 5 Inc. was forced to close down in December 2008. Some of their projects would be briefly resumed in 2009 by another entity, but We Fly was not among them. The game's demise brought to an end the dream of officially supported desktop VR on Wii, as well as the developers' recurring attempts to bring their own take on pilot wings to the market. After years of coming close, it was not meant to be. Julian Egbrecht, speaking to me in 2017, told me the project was loved very much by those that worked on it. The remains of it exist now only in the private collections of former Factor 5 management. If you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to subscribe and check out my other videos for more exclusive looks at lost video games. Unseen 64 is an archive for cancelled, unreleased and unseen video games. You can visit the site at unseen64.net. I've been Liam, I hope you found this video to be of interest and have fun.